Hello there, my fellow space travelers, and welcome to another video in our series on Dune lore. After two episodes on the Bene Gesserit, and hopefully what was a useful presentation of the Butlerian Jihad, I thought it was time to explore, at least for one episode, another very important faction from the Dune setting. Just like the Bene Gesserit, this faction requires multiple videos to be covered properly. But today we shall start with their founding and their history. This faction we're talking about is the Spacing Guild, also known as the Guild of Navigators. You can also influence the future of the series by watching until the end and voting on a new topic. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The earliest history of the Spacing Guild begins with refugees from the Butlerian Jihad, led by a certain Aurelius Ventport and Norma Sevna. These people landed on the world of Tupile, established the so-called Society of Mystic Mariners, and laid the groundwork for what would later become the Guild. The development of the Guild itself began shortly after the disappearance of Ventport and the death of Sevna. The society they founded had allowed gifted Tupilians to join as well, and one such man was Frello Mason, who, more than any other, was responsible for the Spacing Guild's mature form and activity. This guy was described by contemporaries as swarthy, handsome, and cunning, lacking the characteristic Tupilian desire for a settled life. He and his companions possessed a keener awareness of what the universe had to offer, and harbored interstellar ambitions equal to those of the Ixian exiles. When Aurelius Ventport was lost in space in 79 BG, Mason assumed command of the dispirited society, transforming it into a predominantly Tupilian organization serving Tupilian needs as he defined them. Under the leadership of Mason, the society stayed a closed hierarchy with a strict entrance requirement. He thus protected the society's integrity, discipline, and mystique. But his ultimate goal remained that of the Ixian exiles, an interstellar shipping monopoly, moving swiftly and safely through hyperspace. By the time of his death, the guild was well moving along their goal. Leadership of the now strong and well-organized guild passed smoothly to Jasta Mason, the son of Freelo. This guy would inherit his father's skills as well as ambitions. And over the next three decades, Jasta concerned himself with assembling a substantial fleet, and of solving the problem of navigating it. The guild had known of the powers of Spice Melange since the days of Vanport, through, it is believed, the clandestine machinations of the Bene Gesserit. It is also possible that during the early decades of Jasta's leadership, when the fleet was growing and making many secret interstellar voyages, the guild actually found the planet Arrakis, and the source of the spice so vital for their navigational mastery. Thus, by 12 BG, the guild was secure enough in ability and resources to reveal itself from a position of power. The guild's reconnaissance missions had become very numerous, extending its knowledge of political developments in the inhabited worlds and stretching its reach beyond the borders of known space. Mason also perceived correctly that the Corinos were eager to convert their empire into a more permanent organization, with a much more stable and long-lasting basis than the might of the Sardukar. Immediately, he saw a role for the guild in that transformation. But the first approach that Mason directed, although skilled and planned, was a disaster. The first agent of Mason, a man called Zarv, was sent to the imperial governor of Deneb, to discreetly feel out response to the guild's proposal. The agent offered the possibility of the return of interstellar travel, and suggested that the governor contact his superiors so a meeting could be arranged with the guild's agents. The governor, though, in a fit of ravening greed, promptly subjected the subject to torture and interrogation, in an effort to seize the bargain for himself. Unable to believe that the agent had never even seen a member of the guild, the governor kept pushing. The agent, unknown even to himself, 
had been provided by the guild with mental conditioning that would result in his death before he would reveal anything of importance. This horrible failure would send a shock of fear through the guild's directors, locking them in a policy struggle. They had learned enough about the Stardukar armies of the Corinos to feel understandably afraid about dealing directly with House Corino. Nor could the guild approach the Landsrod for a similar reason. What was to prevent the houses from joining together to use the guild against the Emperor? The Landsrod, if that sounds confusing, is sort of a galactic senate made from the representatives of all the major houses. And thus, the guild's inner debate narrowed down to two choices. Either fall back into secrecy or continue negotiating. When put to a vote, the issue was deadlocked. But as chairman, Mason broke the impasse in a speech that one historian called Adelheid Heyman recorded. And I quote, Zarv died horribly, and we are all sorry about it. But we can't let that panic us. You say, be safe, be careful. But Zarv wasn't. Norma Sevna wasn't when the Spice was killing her brain cell by cell. Venport wasn't when he took the fleet into the void. If the Ixians had been safe and careful, all of us right now would be sitting around a campfire wearing skins. The guild can make us great, I tell you. We can be the wings of the Imperium. Right now, at this moment, as we argue, a new humanity is being conceived, and we have the chance to shape the child that will be born. Hesitate now, and the chance will never come again. As the Imperium develops, that child will grow. And if we hide on Tupile for another century or two, when we come out and look at him, we will see that he can fly. But his wings will not be the ships of the guild. But they can be. We can be those wings. If we remember who and what we are, and be bold. His speech did indeed move them, and a unanimous board affirmed his policy. The approaches would continue, mixing boldness with a reserved prudence based on a realistic appraisal of current politics. They sent another emissary, this time to the governor of Nabatea. Even so, the Nabataeans were not inclined to believe claims put forth by an agent who had never seen his superiors, and the governor demanded a demonstration. Thus, the guild transported the governor to the imperial court in three days, a journey that usually took two years. Initiating a practice that was later followed without exception, a guild pilot brought the governorship into orbit and docked it within the Highliner. The Nabataeans were confined to their own ship during the voyage, and were never permitted even a glimpse of the guild ship or its crew. At the time, the Emperor Saudir I was involved in touchy dealings with the Landsrod, over the form of a government that would permit both parties to thrive. The revelations of the guild, whose claims were in fact real, brought a pause to the Corino Landsrat talks, while Sodir integrated the potent new factor of the guild into political calculation. The Emperor saw three different choices. One, deal with the guild on a basis of mutual advantage. Two, seize control of the guild. Or three, destroy the guild. The armies of the Sardukar made that final option possible, but the potential advantages offered by a return of interstellar trade argued against it. Finally, Saudir had to take into consideration the positions of the Landsrod, who could certainly see the benefits of what the guild was offering, but also greatly feared what a return of trade could do to their feudal governments. Saudir, a wise and canny ruler of the times, chose to deal with this complex problem in a great financial synod, convened on the world of Erarium IV in 10 BG. The guild also came to Erarium IV with mixed emotions. While the advantages of the rebirth of interstellar trade were clear to them, the dangers of dealing with the Emperor and the Landsrod were also clear. For at the root of the extraordinary secrecy of the guild lay its greatest danger. Their ability to guide ships through interstellar hyperspace did not lay just in learning, but also in a secret. Obviously, one had to be a trained navigator, but the essence of their abilities lay in the so-called spice trance. 
Thus, unlike the abilities gained through a long period of training, the central power of the guild could actually be stolen and manipulated. If one learned the secret of the spy's trance, one learned what the guild knew. But a masterstroke of purposeful misdirection would save the guild. Like kings bearing gifts, they offered melange, representing it only as a spice which extended human life. The guild ambassadors had been insulated from the exploration and development arms of the organization, and thus they could honestly assert ignorance of the source of the melange. By this maneuver, a daring one for the guild, they hoped to allay any suspicion that Melange had any other additional benefits. This stratagem worked for a very long time, until the guild's reliance on spice prescience was discerned by Paul Atreides himself. At the same time, the emissaries warned against attempts to use the guild for purposes other than those negotiated. They referred obliquely to earlier debates within the Imperial Court, on the possibility of finding and seizing the planetary base of the guild. The ambassadors made it very clear that if any such action was to be entertained, the guild would retreat into secrecy. They pointed that no political entity existing at the time could ever hope to match the guild in space, and furthermore, that a search for their base would take decades. During those years, the guild, even if eventually found, would have destroyed its hyperspace industry. No one would benefit from reckless adventurism, but everyone would benefit if the guild were allowed to exercise its modest function. And so, it was agreed. The years following the close of the Synod in 5 BG, which had also given rise to Trome and the Imperium that Mason had foreseen, were spent in bargaining sessions in which a host of details, like commercial areas, product rights, monetary exchange, tariffs, schedules, transport costs and priorities, were haggled over until agreement was achieved. These sessions involved the newly created Chom Directors and a growing number of off-world guild agents. Jasta Mason died in 31 AG of natural causes, after a long and distinguished career. He was one of the greatest figures in the history of human commerce, but unfortunately he died without a proper successor. But the organization that Jasta and his father had built continued working well via a board of directors. These were intelligent and capable people, but they no longer required an empire builder. Their purpose was not to create but maintain and refine the spacing guild to plume the wings of the Imperium. And thus, the guild became, after the Emperor and the Landsrod, the third leg of political power in the Imperium, with its monopoly on interstellar travel, transport, and banking. Although it did owe formal allegiance to the Imperial House of Corino, from whom it received its charter, the guild was equal in power to both the Emperor and the combined forces of the Landsrod. All communication, travel, trade, and military deployments were dependent upon guild approval. Even the Emperor was forced to employ spies and smugglers in an effort to circumvent guild control. For today's poll, you can vote, or suggest other things if you feel like it, between the following. Option A, more lore on the guild. Option B, the Landsrod and slash or the Great Houses or option C, Chome, the organization that controls economics and trade. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the foundation of the Spacing Guild for today. I realized that the entire concept of faster space travel that the Guild, AirTags, invented also deserves its own video, and I hope that one day I will be able to make that without making it seem too boring. Other than that, what are your thoughts on the Spacing Guild? Do you think their strategy worked, or would you have done it differently? Do share any thoughts, opinions, or questions on them in the comments below. And please try to support the series by watching, liking, sharing, and checking out the other videos in the playlist. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you a great healthy day. May the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.